So uh, today I will be the um, uh, words of uh, John uh, for his communion message for the scripture reading. Um, the, the scripture reading today for John, or for, for our communion message, comes from Genesis 32, uh, 22 through 31. That night, Jacob got up and took, took his two wives and his two female servants and his 11 sons and crossed the, the, the ford of uh, Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all of his possessions. So Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the, the, the socket of Jacob's hips so that his, hitch, his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel. Because you have struggled with God and, and, and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place uh, uh, Penteel, saying, it is because I saw God, God's, face to, God's face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him, and he passed perennial, and and he was limping because of his hip. When we encounter this weird story of Jacob wrestling with a mysterious stranger at midnight by the river Jebek, we are suddenly plunged back into a strange and a mysterious world filled with demigods who wrestle with human beings, a misty, shadowy land where the strength of a man is pitted against the powers and mind of a divine being. It was midnight. Jacob had long before sent his family and property across the river Jabbok, hoping to keep them safe. He divided them into two groups and he sent them by different routes. Perhaps his reasoning was if Esau was still violently angry with him and attacked and destroyed one group, at least the other would still be safe. Strangely, Jacob made no preparation to ensure his own safety. Having seen to the safety of his family, Jacob then settled down to remain alone and vulnerable throughout the night. Why the solitary watch? Was he trying to prepare himself for his encounter with Esau? Was he seeking to come to some special relationship with God? We don't know. Earlier chapters have already shown us Jacob had grown away from the strong uh, egocentricity that marked his conduct in youth and during the early stages of his exile. The younger Jacob would have run when told Esau was coming to meet him with 400 armed men. But now he listened to the voice that told him to stay. And though solicitous regarding the welfare of his family and of his servants, he does not try to bargain with God. Instead, he offers a nobler prayer of thanksgiving for all that God has done for him and for all the blessings that he has received. He implores God to save him from Esau's wrath. It seems obvious that, Grace, that Jacob had grown considerably in spirit during the years of his exile. Maybe this was the motive behind his desire to spend the night in solitude beside the lonely river. There are occasions when a person facing a great crisis, whether positive or negative in nature, longs to withdraw from even the most trusted and loved friends. There are some key experiences which can come to us only when we're alone. When we're alone, it is though the threshold of consciousness is lowered and powerful inner experiences can cross over into the consciousness which would be screened out if our attention was diverted. Jacob was immersed in a profound silence of that desolate area. 
Oh, there was the murmur of the brook sliding over the, stair the stones, but the night was still and his aloneness was complete. We have no way of knowing the thoughts and the fears which had assailed him. Was he dwelling in pride upon his accomplishments or in sorrow over his failures or in fear over his future? All we know is as he sat there pondering, he suddenly became aware of a mysterious combatant at his side. And without warning, this being leaped upon him and wrestled with him until daybreak. There was some sort of spiritual power, some unnatural adversary who was unexpectedly struggling with him in the darkness. It didn't take too, too much imagination to understand the amount of courage, the tremendous moral and physical and psychological strength that it took for Jacob to engage in combat with this mysterious stranger who, without provocation, attacked him out of the inky blackness of the night. Was this a literal contest? There's no reason to deny it. There must have been some sort of physical contact because when Jacob resumed his journey the next morning, he was lame. This physical fact is commemorated today by Jews who abstain from eating that part of the animal, which corresponds to the hip and the thigh area in Jacob. People are not normally hurt in imaginary contests. At the same time, it's fair to conclude that the outward wrestling was only a symbol of the spiritual struggle which engaged the patriarch's soul. All night they fought and Jacob held his own. The strength that years before had rolled the stone from the well to allow Rachel's sheep to drink was still there and the stranger apparently could not prevail against him. And finally, when the day began to dawn and at this point, the mysterious one wanted to break off the struggle. It would seem that this is some kind of a spiritual encounter which vanishes with light. Psychologists tell us it's a fact that our minds are different at night, closer to the primitive level. And there are psychological experiences which occur in the darkness, but which vanish with the dawn. However, Jacob was not willing to let this conflict end so readily. He had fought throughout the night. He wanted to know some meaning for the struggle. I will not let you go unless you bless me, he said. And at this point, the mysterious one asked Jacob his name. And when told, said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have been strong against God. The object of this new name was to contrast the old man with the new, and therefore it marked a change in Jacob's status. The Anchor Bible says it's to indicate the transformation of the, of the once devious Jacob into a forthright and a resolute fighter. And after Jacob received his blessing through the change of his name, he then asked to know this stranger's name. But the mysterious one refused to tell him and simply left as the sun rose. However, before he departed, he did a strange thing. He touched Jacob on the hip and he wounded him. So later as he departed the area, Jacob left the river Jabbok limping. An interesting point is the ease in which this combatant disabled Jacob. It gives us every reason to think that he could have won the battle at any time during the night, but he chose to let it continue. Therefore, the meaning of the encounter must lie in the struggle itself. The purpose of this adversary was to test Jacob, not to destroy him. Jacob came out of that battle equipped to be in the best and the most productive part of his life. The sun rose upon him just as he passed Penuel limping on his hip. It cost him. It was the dawn of a new day for Jacob, but he had to limp into it. 
Sanford suggests that the wound Jacob received is simply the mark of anyone who encounters a deep spiritual reality. Because any person who has an experience of psychological depth is always wounded by it. We do know that Jacob did not return to his old ways. He was a changed individual. And this is seen in his dealings with his own children and the counsel that he later gives to Joseph. It's also shown by the fact that he goes down to his grave in Egypt, a beloved and a respected old man. The individual who left Penuel is not the same conniver who bargained with God at Bethel. This is a fairly accurate picture of life. People tend to struggle, to fight, to wrestle with God, but there normally comes a point where if we develop properly, we recognize that we cannot cope with all that life has handed us. A point where we just cling in desperation and we seek the blessing of God. And then, if the dawn breaks properly for us, we receive the divine blessing. And we hear the whispered new name and open our eyes to find ourselves living with new obligations and new opportunities. Thus we enter into a new future and view the dawn of a new day. We may go forth limping, as it were, from our spiritual and psychological wounds, but we also know that into our battered and our scarred ego has been poured new life from God. Last month we studied the parables of the gardens. And one of the principal themes is of it was Christ was telling us to look and see the life that we desired most to live. And that was our garden, the blessings that we might expect from it. God also told us not to worry about the weeds, that he had plans for those and he had ways to take care of them, that we shouldn't let them distract us from our vision of that life we had. Imagine when you came up out of the water of baptism and you looked and you began immediately to see the life that lay before you. How did you picture that, if you can remember? For some of us, it's been a long time. But it didn't have any weeds. It didn't have any obstacles. It was full of hope. And it was full of our aspirations. And then that brings us to our point that we have today. God loved us enough and he knew that there were going to be weeds in our gardens. He knew that there were going to be things that we struggled with and we, we thought we'd let him down in our covenant. And so he arranged the moment that we come to now in our worship. He arranged a sacrament that let us be renewed in our acquaintance with him, with our understanding of him. And let us know that in spite of all of the things that we've gone through, we're going to have a new chance to renew that covenant and to see him and to go forward with new hope and new aspirations and a better understanding of what lies in our life. Kurt was right when he said we're in a predicament. <laughs> Some of us are in a big predicament because we're crippled in the middle of all this stuff. But at the same time, uh, we can see the future ahead of us. And I assure you that it's not going to be much longer. And as we participate in this communion today, let us know that God is with us, that he goes from this struggle and the things that we gain from it, the strength we, and the testimonies that we gain from it will only serve to make our lives better and easier to understand. And the things that we have supposedly suffered and sacrificed and lost will bind us together more closely as a community, which helps us more to understand the love that he has for us. And so I invite you now, or Kurt will invite you in a few moments, to uh, partake of this sacrament with the understanding that uh, God is still with us. He loves us beyond our understanding. And in spite of the things that we thought we've gone through, in spite of the ways that we thought we failed him, he stands ready to renew us and to strengthen us and to walk with us 
again from this moment forward. Amen.